everyone. How's everyone? Good. Lord Foster, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Wonderful. So I, I know you don't need introductions, but I will do it anyway. So Lord Foster, you're one of the world's leading high-tech architects. You founded Foster and Partners in the 70s. Over five decades, you've been responsible for some of the most beautiful things that surround us. So of course, some of the radical projects vary in sizes and shapes. You're the president of the Norman Foster Foundation, and we're here to talk about how cities can actually renew themselves to be more sustainable, to be healthier, to be safer and happier places. So first of all, how, how do you start? I think you start with cities in crises because we've gone through the crisis of, of a pandemic. Um, and is that going to change? Is COVID going to change the cities? It's a question that I'm asked. We all have an opinion. Um, I would say that the lessons of history are that it's not going to change anything. It's going to magnify exaggerate trends that were already there. Um, and I guess in the long arc of history, if you look at crises historically, uh, take London. We, what's the DNA of London? Historically, it's the great sort of Georgian terraces, the squares, the brick. Um, when we look at that, we don't think about the great fire of London and the way that that ushered in a new form of construction, fireproof construction. When we go along the Thames embankment and we see a clean river and underground public transport, we don't think about the cholera epidemic of the middle of the 19th century, the 1850s, which brought in an individual who introduced modern sanitation to London. Now, all of these things, the embankment, modern sanitation, fireproof construction, would have happened anyway, but they were, they were hastened. Um, the same is true in New York, cholera. When you see joggers going around the reservoir in Central Park, you don't think about cholera, the introduction of clean water. Um, so, uh, so I think that it, it's, it, 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 it's an accelerator. Lord Foster, and we're looking at beautiful images of, of some of the things that you've built. So, you know, there were the headquarters for Swiss Re in London. There's, for example, the enclosure for the Smithsonian Institute Patent Office in Washington. There's the Queen Alia International Airport in Jordan. I could go on and on and on. And of course, all of these cities have souls and they're very different one another. So how, how do you immerse yourself before you decide on sketching something into the soul of a city? I think you try and absorb the, uh, the place. So there are the things that you can quantify. You can quantify the climate, you can quantify the amount of space. But uh, it, it's, it's really how do you find the values that lie below the surface? So it's walking a city, it's talking to people, it's being a good listener, it's doing research, it's absorbing the DNA, whether that's a city, a place, whether it's an organization, uh, what's its mission, what are, what are its values, and how can the infrastructure of a city, the connections, the public spaces, the urban glue that binds the individual buildings together, or if it's an individual building, how do you, how, how do you establish what, what, what a, so you give physical form to that. And in the process, hopefully, you anticipate change and change for good. I, is there a magic ratio of outside space versus buildings? I know you've worked on, on both outside spaces. I'm an architect by training, by background, and, uh, and I live by the stimulation of designing buildings. But if I had to uh, try to uh, look beyond that, I'd say that in any city, the, uh, the infrastructure, the boulevards, the streets, the alleys, the piazzas, the bridges, the public transport, the stuff underneath the surface, the gateways. So our arrival here in Amsterdam, our experience of the canals, the urban life, the cafes, the terraces, We'll take that away. That's more powerful than any individual building. So we have a lot of mayors here. 
what should they be thinking about when they think of something new for their city or for their airports? I, I would guess following in a long tradition of master planning because political administrations come and go. So the vision for the future embodied in a master plan reflects the long-termism that, that in a way supersedes the short term of a political office. But there is absolutely no question, and Mike Bloomberg has said it far more eloquently than I can, I mean, the future is with city mayors. Um, you know, cities are the future. They generate, what, 80% of the wealth uh, of a global economy. They're responsible for 60% of, of, of emissions. And, you know, they can make and do make decisions, which, uh, which is faster than a government can do. So it, it's, it was fascinating hearing you say, you know, we didn't, we don't remember when there was cholera, we don't remember some of these epidemics, but they've changed the way we live in cities. What do you think the legacy of COVID will be? Will people, is it urban? Is it more working from home? We also have high gas prices. It's difficult to, to, I mean, there's so many challenges at the moment for cities. It's difficult to it's see where we end up. It's interesting, in the year before COVID, um, I was approached by a group and we're doing a project which is essentially a third place. It's, um, it's seeking to arrest the decline of a village in rural Switzerland by creating a third place on the basis that people will work from home, they'll work from the office, and there'll be a third place which will combine leisure, family activities, workshops, and bring new life to a declining rural village. And everybody says, that's a result of COVID, isn't it? But it was conceived in advance of, of, of COVID. So um, I think the one change that perhaps it will make is public perception. If I think back, the transformation of Trafalgar Square took consultation with thousands of people, a lot of public debate, probably extended over two or three years, almost overnight, in COVID, you saw in cities across the world, you saw the increase in the pedestrian realm. Somehow cars still kept moving, but outdoor cafes prospered. There was a kind of return to nature. So public opinion, I think, uh, is, is, is one very positive consequence of that. I think there is a genuine appetite to see to see positive change, to see you know, the quality of life, urban life, improve. Do you feel like our societies seem very divided at the moment across the world for a number of reasons? Can building communities at a city level help bridge that? I think the physical infrastructure, the public spaces, can help create the sense of community. Uh, the ideal city is a compact, walkable, pedestrian-friendly, mixed use. Um, and, and many of the, and Amsterdam is just a perfect example of that compact, dense, alive city, which defies all the traditional zoning. I mean, uh, if you think about it, uh, we're drawn to historic centers where everything is mixed up. It, you don't have the residential zone, the cultural zone, the industrial zone. You have, well, for clean industries, you have workshops, it's mixed up with galleries, with restaurants, people live above the shop. Um, that's the very essence of a, of a community. So I think that, um, again, the, the, the way in which crises, th there are all kinds of interesting common denominators. I mean, um, Kharkiv approached myself, my foundation, my colleagues, um, through the United Nations, where I head out the Forum of Mayors, um, for a master plan for, for reconstruction. And, um, and in the conversations with the mayor, I reminded him, by way of reassurance, that, um, that the, the master plan, the Abercrombie plan for Greater London, was conceived in the darkest hours of World War II, 1943, two years before the war ended. Um, and, um, and the themes are remarkably similar to the issues we're talking about today. Mobility, congestion. Uh, it reinforced the idea of the green belt as a protection 
around reducing sprawl, concentrating activity. It was about leisure, it was about homes, reconstruction, and, uh, and affordable housing has to be on the lips of everybody who is involved in a city uh, right now. It's, it's so, so those challenges go back uh, historically, and, um, and I think one of the wonderful advantages of this gathering is that cities do learn from each other, and this encourages that process. But how difficult is it to rebuild a city like Kharkiv? Even Kiev, we know today, is being bombed, and so keeping the memory of what a city or a country has lived through, but also looking forward. It's interesting, at uh, one point along the way, the mayor of Kharkiv reminded me about the Reichstag and instanced that as something that would have the imprint of conflicts past and that there should perhaps be the equivalent in Kharkiv. Um, uh, but again, uh, seen optimistically through that mayor, it's about how can the city see this as an opportunity to regenerate itself as a city of the future and the present, with an emphasis on science, and looking at science and technology in a, in a new neighborhood way. I'm looking at pictures, actually, of the London office. It's so beautiful. Is it your favorite building? <laughs> what can oh, I okay. say? <laughs> of course. That was a planted question. Um, <laughs> there's also, I mean, you made news recently about you know, the, the launch of this new sustainability declaration. Why is it important for architects to think about sustainability, but also maybe to sign something that says, I pledge that I will you know, work against climate change? Well, the United Nations approached me with this um, uh, it's now called the San Marino Declaration because it was launched one week ago, last Monday, in, in San Marino. Um, if you distill it down, it's about all the issues which is on the agenda. For, it's about climate neutrality. It's about public space, housing. It's about inclusivity. It's about clean energy. It's about all the good things for the future, about combating climate uh, global warming, rising sea levels. Um, uh, and it was explained to me that it was wonderfully directed at architects and engineers. My only contribution to this, apart from helping to launch it, was suggesting it should be a wider remit. And that happened in the session. Um, I suggested that it shouldn't just be architects and engineers. It should be everybody who's involved in shaping the environment. It should be city managers when they're procuring. They should be asking about the products, the street furniture in the cities. Developers, anybody should buy into those principles. And, um, and, and I, 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 I was asked to share some experiences to bring those principles alive. And I showed one or two projects. And towards the end, I said, imagine if all those people who came together, and it took so long with public debates and people were talking about sustainability, explained to me, if everybody had bought into that earlier, that would have made the process so much faster. Uh, it would have been so you know, more enjoyable. I think the other element is that the city of the future has to be more fun. You know, we don't talk about that. I mean, uh, there's um, uh, one thing, small quote, um, the, in 1871, Chicago was largely destroyed by fire. And Burnham, Daniel Burnham, was commissioned for the plan. Mm -hmm. And that's Chicago as it is now. In the same way that when we see London, it's the London that was born out of World War II. So he said, this is a small quote, make no little plans, make big plans. Remember that a noble, logical diagram, once recorded, will never die. Let your watchword be order and your beacon beauty. And that's as valid now as it was in 1909. <laughs> well, on that, Lord Foster, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.